Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session with Tom Dixon. My name is Marcus Hartwell, and I'm the Managing Director of House in the Nordics. And be before I hand over the word to Tom, I would just get, like to give you a very brief introduction to House. So this is House. Uh, apologies for the non-Swedish-speaking people in the room. I'll help you with the translation. But what House is, it's an end-to-end -end platform for homeowners to find inspiration, to find a professional for their project, and to find the products uh, for their home. So it's very much an end-to-end -end platform. And the key components are uh, photos, photon, where people go for inspiration. We have over 9 million high-definition photos on the platform, where you can sort and search by room type, by style. The next part is Hitta Expert, Find a Pro, which is very much used to find architects, to find interior designers, both for national projects and international projects. And then we have products, producer, where people go to find the products um, that they want to furnish their homes with. So it's very much an end-to-end -end platform. We also have something called magazine, which is our editorial part, where we write and curate articles based on the beautiful imagery that's been uploaded to the platform. And at the core, for all the professionals and brands in the room here, it's all about creating a profile on the platform, uh, which takes little more than 15 minutes at no cost. And the reason for having a, a profile, such as Tom Dixon has here, it's three reasons. One is brand building. Every month, 35 million homeowners worldwide visit this platform. Um, so it's a great, great, great target group to reach. Two, it's about finding new clients, new relevant clients. What we see happening on house each day is architects, interior designers, not only getting projects in their local area, but also getting projects internationally. Um, so it's an extremely effective way to reach new clients. And then three, it's about collaborating more effectively with potential homeowners or other professionals in projects. So house. It's a platform that celebrates beautiful design. One of my favorite lamps, uh, one of yours, Tom, the beat light, uh, I made a search of last night on house, and I found so many images that have been uploaded by other professionals. In this case, it's an interior design company in London called The Works, uh, that then have uh, Tom Dixon's beat lights there. And this image has been viewed over half a million times. Half a million. Yeah, and it's been downloaded more than 17,000 times. So to have your imagery, your project, your beautiful products on this platform gives absolutely incredible exposure. But today, the topic is not beautiful design. It's actually design and how not to do it. So with that said, let me introduce you to the world-renowned designer, Mr. Tom Dixon. <laughs> OK. Thank you. OK. Um, hi. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Okay, I, I kind of called this talk uh, Design How Not To Do It because I get bored of talking about design. You all know about design, a lot of you are design professionals. So I thought I'd talk about everything that surrounds design. And I think when I look at my, um, my career, um, it's, it's more important to look at uh, the mistakes I made rather than uh, the successes. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of those, um, my, my old failures, um, and uh, maybe a bit about the future as well. So how long have we got? We've got 40 minutes or something, right? Okay. So um, I, show, I show this slide because I was a very, a very attractive young lad at the time, but mainly because it, it proves that I was not even remotely interested in design. I was much more interested in music. And um, this was a picture of me, age 17, um, before my career um, as a bass guitarist in a disco band. So that lasted two years um, until an unfortunate motorcycle accident where I broke my arm on the eve of a tour and was replaced by a much better bass player who now plays for Pink Floyd. So that could have been my destiny. Um, but the important thing about the music business, and particularly the music business in London at the time, um, was that it was uh, a, a time 
um, where it was possible to be um, creative. And I think the, the music business and the punk, the punk uh, legacy of London at the time allowed people um, a great control of, over their own uh, creativity. Um, everything seemed possible. So when I was at school, the Sex Pistols were number one in the hit parade. They couldn't play their instruments. Um, they couldn't sing particularly well. Their, their tunes were pretty piss poor, but they were number one in the hit parade with no airplay. They were banned from the BBC at the time. And I think that kind of gave a whole generation an inspiration, if you like, that anything was possible. So if I go back to this picture, it's, I think you can see that, that some of the, um, the uh, influences of London at the time. So here you see a, a similar object to uh, a, a punk record, if you like. It's, it's uh, using no new materials, no tools, no skills. It's a very dangerous and ugly chair as well. Um, it's rusty chair and it's uh, uh, definitely a non-commercial chair. But the thing that it does have is, is an attitude. And I think um, a personal attitude is almost the most important thing that you can have in the contemporary world if you want to stick out from everything around you. So where it failed on every level as a chair or as a design, it did have bags of, uh, of the essential ingredient. So here you can see there's no, uh, I didn't have any tools, uh, it's just made with my own hands. Um, my, my design becomes slightly more solid um, but the most important thing that I did wasn't so much the designing, but the making. And um, by not going to art school, I think I was slightly less restricted than a lot of uh, students in the, in the number of objects I could make. So maybe in my first year, I might have made 50 chairs um, or 100 chairs, I can't remember, but they improved very quickly. So you can already see uh, a big step forward. This is my attempt at an office chair. It rotates. Um, it's still not very comfortable, but it's much, much more solid. Um, and I, I like to think of design um, really more as alchemy um, in a way. What was kind of important to me at the time was, um, and, and what um, made me believe in myself as a designer was actually the money. People paying um, to acquire one of these pieces is what gave me the confidence to make more. I think if people hadn't bought them, I, I, it would have remained a, a hobby. Um, number one, and also uh, wouldn't allow me to make the next one. I had such a small studio that if I didn't sell my object, um, I couldn't make the next one. So I think there's a, 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 an alchemy element to, to design, particularly my design, because it really was turning rubbish into gold, almost literally. And then, you know, I discovered my superpower, which was welding. And welding is, is a, a technique that you all know, but what it does do is allow you to make very strong structures very quickly. And it suited my very impatient um, demeanor and allowed me to make more things. So commerce was important, the alchemy was important, and also really converting it into um, something to sell was very important. So you can see that the objects start becoming slightly more formal. I stop using scrap metal um, and start finding objects in cookery shops. So here you see a Chinese ladle, a French frying pan, and um, some bicycle forks um, making um, a much more chair-looking chair. Um, and I've, I've always been interested in the structure of objects. I think in, in, the, in the contemporary design world, which is uh, digitally obsessed, um, it's all too easy for people to make um, something out of metal or glass on screen or turn it into wood at the press of a button. Uh, but my design's always been informed by the structures within. And you can kind of see that from... Um, as my welding improves, as my objects become more engineered, um, as I use finer materials, um, that it really is the structure that informs the shape of the object rather than, um, rather than an idea about shape at the beginning. Um, so I teach myself a bit of engineering, um, mainly through trial or, and, and error, and make these slightly more structural chairs. Um, then the influence on, on the design becomes much more the machinery that I buy. So um, after having bought my first welding machine, I then buy a guillotine, which allows me to slice metal into strips, and, and all of my production suddenly becomes made out of strips of metal. So, so the other influence is really the technology or the engineering um, tools around it, the manufacturing processes as well. Um, 
I get um, to a stage where I might, uh, you know, I have uh, maybe 17 um, people or welding in a studio doing self-production effectively, and that is um, uh, that was a, a great period. But I'm now moving on, maybe five years forward. I decide to found my own plastic company and try and make um, some plastic objects. So get out of manufacturing and, and get more into design and distribution. <clears throat> that lasts a while, and uh, whoops. Um, I keep on making things on the side. This is a, a chair which is still made out of um, found objects. And you can see here a, a Golf GTI steering wheel as a base here, and the rubber tube from a, a, a tire wrapped around. A much more comfortable chair. You can see it, probably a more sculptural chair as well than before. Uh, and uh, I thought quite successful because it was very bouncy, but it was a commercial disaster. And it was only when I got to um, be recognized by the Italian luxury companies, um, and they started making the goods that um, they started taking off on the international market and selling. So this one was a disaster because it still smelt of rubber, even though it was very comfortable. And this one was a commercial success for Capellini, an Italian company, um, because they made it to a very high standard. And really, the Italians um, at the time completely understood the power of design as transformative for industry, you know, adding value to their industries in a way that the UK industry really didn't understand anymore. At the time, the, the British industries were on the verge of collapse <clears throat> and there was very little support. So I had some good times in Italy. Um, we ate incredible meals. Um, they made my, my products to a very high standard. It gave me a bit more of an international profile because the Italians are amazing exporters of luxury goods. Um, but in the end, it wasn't really a very good living. And so I had to get my first job. And I was very lucky to get <clears throat> my first job with a Swedish company because they owned Habitat at the time. Uh, and so IKEA owned Habitat, and I was the creative director at Habitat. So what I learned in, in Habitat for the 10 years I was there was actually nothing to do with, with design at all. Um, it was really much more to do with global sourcing, with um, design management, with communication, with marketing, with cataloging and also with retail, a much closer um, connection with the customer than most designers get. So I'll skip over my, um, my 10 years of, of Habitat completely because I got tired of, of the corporate world and I wanted to get back to doing my own thing. And so I decided to create my own brand. <clears throat> so that brings us a bit more up to date and that's sort of 12 years ago, I jumped from the frying pan into the fire as we say, and uh, went from a corporate job um, to nothing at all. But when I, I, I think branding is a very overused term in, in design and in marketing. And for me, I see it very much as a kind of stamp of authority and ownership on, on goods, you know, a bit like a cowboy would have originally done. And I'm very lucky to have a, a superbly balanced name, um, very snappy and very brandable, something that stamps really well into, into product. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, um, you know, Japanese designers, Konstantin Gurchich and the rest of it, it's much more difficult to be a brand, right? But I'm, I'm fortunate to have a, a, a name which is easy to stamp into things. And the reason I wanted to start my own brand is very much this, right? So this is the nature of the, of the furniture industry, an amazing company called Vitra um, that makes a huge selection of amazing goods, um, some from um, the giants of design of today. They're mainly a, a, an office supply company, but they also do these iconic objects from the history of design. And um, it does really good business, very profitable company, immaculate um, quality. But the picture for the designers looks a bit like this. So as a designer working for um, one of the big brands, you're really in competition with everybody else. You're in competition with the real giants of design, like Werner Panton or the Eameses. Um, you're in competition with uh, your own countrymen, so Jasper Morrison in this case. You're in competition with the French, the Japanese, the Israelis, um, the Dutch, uh, Norman Foster all competing under one manufacturing umbrella, which is Vitra. So it's not a great um, position to be in if you're a designer, um, to uh, have your product um, produced by one of the bigger companies, because you have no real control over, over the output. Um, for some people, it's a very successful business, but for most people, um, 
it's a nice to have. When you get to Herman Miller, it gets even worse. You know, maybe 50 designers all competing for attention under the manufacturing umbrella. And then you're really up against some of the superstars of, of, um, of design. So, you know, I, th I think um, if you're a very prolific designer, if you're a very good industrial designer, it might be a good bet. But for me, it just wasn't the, the thing to do at all. So that's why I created my own label. And I have um, spent 12 years um, trying to work out um, exactly how you output your own production. And um, the model is a bit closer to, say, a fashion designer. It's not abnormal for a fashion designer to take on their own distribution, product development, and, uh, and retail. Um, but it's very unusual for that to happen in, in um, interior design and product design. So this is where we do it. And we do, it in, um, we do it in London. So you're welcome to come to our studio in London. We, we try and have as open of, uh, an office as possible. We've got a restaurant, a showroom, and the office all in this um, uh, space on, on, the, on the canal in North Kensington, uh, close to Portobello Road. And, um, and this is what I'm, I'm able to do as an independent designer. If I decide that I want to have everything in fluorescent orange, um, then there's nobody to stop me, really. It's not, you know, it's not really a good idea, I have to say, because people, <laughs> people don't really want fluorescent orange. But at least it gives me a degree of control over my own destiny, which I think for, for a lot of people is, is, um, is kind of absent from um, the normal model, the studio model of designing for other, other brands. Um, so I've had many Swedish collections. I know Proventus are here. They've supported me for, for, for ten, 10 of the years um, that I've been in business. Um, and we're a British brand um, with international ambitions. And, and the product that we try and produce is, um, has a few basic... Uh, underpinnings, and, and one of those is a very strong materiality. You'll see um, that in our products we try as much as possible to have a substantial um, materiality. These are cast glass, and, and they're so tough that they're actually dishwasher proof. You can just stick them in the dishwasher and clean them, for instance. Um, and also, uh, another characteristic is sort of expressed um, uh, minimalism. So they're, they're, they're relatively um, expressive, but they're also um, relatively neutral, if that makes any sense, which means that they can work in many different um, interiors. We do a lot of lighting, and lighting is an excellent field to work in at the moment because it's a, <clears throat> it's a field which has got not only um, <clears throat> uh, a great deal of scientific development going on, um, there's also um, you know, power saving, new light sources, cold light sources, flat light sources coming through. So for any designer, it's a dream to work in a field that is in full um, development, if you like. But it's also a place where people are prepared um, to be modern. I think increasingly in, in, um, in interiors, uh, some of the bigger investment pieces like sofas and the rest of them are very conservative. But people always seem quite happy to be a bit more um, uh, imaginative when it comes to uh, specifying lighting. So lighting's been a very good field for us, and you'll see a lot of uh, these quite simple geometries coming through, um, a lot of surface finishes, so this is a very much a, a luster finish uh, made with real gold, for instance, where each lamp is, is completely different according to which position it's placed in the kiln. A lot of... Um, of um, structures that, that play with shadows and, and, and lighting, like this etch lamp, for instance, which has got the advantage of, of not only giving you a free carpet when you, when you buy your lamp, but also free wallpaper by the patterns that it casts, right? So you get all of this extras, um, and you can buy that one on the Guled stand in Hall, Hall B. Yeah. Um, so, and these big clusters of lighting, which we've become um, quite known for. Um, so you'll see... Uh, many decorative lamps and, and also some attempts at making lamps that really do illuminate as well. So this is a new lamp based very much on the lenses that you see in lighthouses, for instance. 
And I wanted to tell you another little Swedish story of our first collaboration. So um, sometimes the lamps that I made, this copper lamp, which, I, which has been a quite a big success, um, looks even nicer when it's broken. So these, are, these lamps get crushed when they, when, um, in the factory if they're not um, A-grade. And the crushed lamps look really beautiful like that. So I've been trying to produce this crushed lamp for a long time, um, but impossible to make until I came across the girls from front and one of their moulds that they've used in a Stockholm park um, and, and picked it up in the factory without realising it was a front lamp. And by working on the surface finish and working on the engineering, so again, a kind of not a design, but more surface, um, surface finish, um, we, we managed to make this extra extraordinary um, effect, which is a kind of internal reflection. So the, um, the, the metallization on the lamp is maybe two microns thick. Um, and is, is put on the lamp with a, uh, a technique called vacuum metallization, which is used for things like sunglasses, for instance. And what happens is that you set up a, a series of internal reflections, and this very um, soft shape of lamp becomes uh, a, a very complex um, and hard-to-read object, which looks like it's been handmade, but it's actually uh, a, an industrial blow molding. So that, that's our first collaboration, and a, a, Swedish, a Swedish love story between me and Front. And uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's, it's the one that's really uh, took off last year. So a, uh, a lamp called Melt. So we do also furniture and um, furniture, again, the, the idea is really to be a brand which isn't a lighting brand, but a brand that does um, furniture, lighting and accessories. And you can see that we, um, uh, th there's some things appearing there that you'll recognize from very early on in my career. Some things which are to do also with kind of British tradition reinvented, like this uh, upholstered chair. And, and the same thing's coming through of this very um, relatively simple um, but graphic, recognizable shapes that you'll see a lot in, in the things that we do. And then more and more accessories, which has been fantastic for allowing us to have a much broader clientele and also having adventures in all kinds of different worlds like cooking, for instance, or food preparation and, and food, food service. Um, a lot of, uh, again, heavy materiality, big slabs of marble, big slabs of, of uh, cast iron, and um, these things which also have this, uh, uh, an idea of a historical um, departure point, but could be art deco or could be fu future kind of space age teapot kind of thing. And so I like it when, when objects have, uh, can be read in lots of different ways. So the accessories have been, I know you prefer coffee to tea in, in Sweden, so we've made you a coffee set as well. Right. And then adventures in all kinds of other um, intangible areas. I think design often focuses on the, um, on the objects that you can really see. But what's been kind of interesting about the accessories is it's allowed us to also have adventures in smells. So actually designing through your nose rather than through um, your eyes. So, and what's been a, a really good thing for us as a product company is to have an interior design company. So I'm going to... We have maybe 20% of what we do is interior uh, services. So what we do is quite a lot of interiors as well. And that really does make us into much better product designers. So it's a kind of feedback loop for our products, a testing ground for our products, and a showcase for our products as well. And again, it's kind of unusual for a, a, a furnishings brand to also have a, a serious interior design studio. This is an a, a, um, office for McCann Erickson, the big... Um, ad agency in New York, which is really about the new methods of working, which mean that you don't need to be stuck to your desk. This is a, a, a restaurant for uh, Jamie Oliver, the, the celebrity British chef, a sort of barbecue restaurant in, in London. This is the lobby of a, of a big hotel we've completed last year in, in um, London called the Mondrian, which has got a very nautical theme. And the, the beauty of uh, working in... in uh, in big hotels, is it? it's almost like designing a whole village. You get to design not just the, the lobby spaces, but the domestic spaces like rooms, the spas, um, the bars, cocktail bar in this case, cinemas even, conference rooms, corridors, um, huge spaces and very, very constrained spaces as well. So it's been a great exercise in, in working in lots and lots of different um, functionalities as well. So that really does inform the product side of it. It makes us better at doing lighting because we're, we're dealing with real situations rather than fictional ones. So a cocktail bar in Atlanta in Georgia, a kind of illegal uh, speakeasy. Yeah. 
And then, you know, just to cap it all, if you weren't jealous enough of my ability to be a designer without any formal training, I'm now also an untrained architect. So this is my first house that I've done. So I didn't have to do the seven years training, um, but I managed to do a house for a private client in Monaco. So that was... Um, an absolute nightmare working um, in, in architecture because it's much, much more difficult than it looks. I thought it would be easy. Um, I was so naive. Um, but what, what it does show is the, a, a kind of transferal of the very similar kind of attitude, which are expressed materiality, very simple shapes, building up a, a stronger uh, and more identifiable graphic form. Um, where the swing pool and, and the bedroom all um, express different kind of geometric volumes here. Um, so I'll just quickly tell you a bit about the development of, of some of the objects that, that, that this lamp was referred to by um, uh, uh, as a, a popular lamp in our uh, selection. And it's called the Beat Lamp. And, it, and it's, it has a nice little story, which is really it was a, a not-for-profit project, which we started in, with the British Council in, in Jaipur, in India, where they have these um, amazing metal workers that have been working for generations. They work actually, you know, in, in the small streets of Jaipur, making these beautiful pots that have been used for, for many, many years in, in villages to hold water and to carry water. And um, these pots have been, again, used for generations. They last for generations. Um, but the, the council, the town, um, the town council in Jaipur wants to move the metal workers out to make way for tourists. So they're rapidly losing their skills. And also what's happening is that the beautiful pots are being replaced by much cheaper industrially made equivalents, like these plastic pots here. So the idea here was to really not to do, again, not to do design, but to try and just divert some of those shapes and those techniques to a new market, if you like. And so the idea was really to um, really do as little design as possible because the, the, the skills are very specific and to just repurpose the things as, a, as lighting objects. So you can see the shapes are, are roughly the same as the, as the jars and, and the surface and, and we retain the hammering which is so beautiful as well. And it's been a, a pretty big success in terms of our of our company, and, and we do, um, although the metalworks transferred to another uh, town, a metalworking town called Muradabad, um, we, we do employ some, something in the region of uh, 20 metalworkers just working on these things, and the range has expanded, and when you go online, you'll see lots and lots of things, you know, through house and the rest of it, but on eBay, you'll see many versions of these Tom Dixon lamps, all of which are fake, which is a bit of a blow, really. So, um... We, and, and when, so there's maybe 20 pages of beat lights on, on eBay, not a single one of which is a, a real one. They're all coming in from China at a low cost. And when you get to China, um, it gets even worse. So on Tibao and Alibaba, um, you're getting 30 pages of, of beat lights, with, uh, which are all extremely cheap. And so I'm here today to tell you to buy the original and buy the real one in Hall B, um, rather than these cheap equivalents online. I hope Howes aren't, aren't endorsing this. Um, but um, so, so it's been a really big problem for us, and we've had to find all kinds of ways of trying to deal with it as a brand, because there's very little you can do from a, a legal standpoint in terms of protecting yourself against copies. And so we have to do all kinds of things. We have to think of faster ways to market, for instance. So I'll tell you about a couple of um, experiments in, in getting faster to market. You know, uh, the, the, the furniture business is one of the last to be disrupted, if you like, and it's one of those businesses which is very old-fashioned, very dusty. What happens is that, you know, normally you design something thing in, in, um, in Europe. Um, you have to get an industrialist to invest a huge amount of money in you know, doing tooling and, and, and making the thing probably in a low-wage economy on the other side of the world. You then ship it across to Europe, where it sits in a, in a warehouse or distribution center, and then sometimes you ship it back out to Asia to sell it. Um, and then it'll sit in a design shop for many um, months before anybody buys it, getting dusty. So it's a very inelegant business. It's not a particularly attractive business um, for, the, for the designer or for the industrialist, for that matter. And um, I thought there must be better ways to do it than, than, than to have this really complex, um, old-fashioned ways of doing it. So the idea was really to try and, and remodel um, some of the things that we do on, on some of the more innovative companies like Google and, and start thinking about maybe giving away furniture for free. And it's important to note that today I'm not giving anything away for free. So you can't go and collect anything from my stand and take it away. But this was an experiment in, in, um, in being hyper generous. And it allowed me to 
um, take an object from the factory direct to a point of distribution and get rid of 1,000 chairs in six minutes. So I put all of the chairs on Trafalgar Square in the middle of London, and I invited people to come, had a four-day campaign on, on uh, local radio, and it was great, we got a queue around the block, and I, um, it was a beautiful sunny day, which is quite rare in London, and we had this fever happen where people went completely mad. They become very greedy when things are free, and it was an ugly scene, really. Um, so here we had uh, people trying to st take two chairs instead of their um, allowed one, for instance, without really thinking through how they were going to get the thing home. Um, and here you see the fever um, that develops. But anyway, very successful from the perspective of becoming popular in the short term, um, very successful from the perspective of um, speed of distribution. We made the stuff in the north of England, transported it with one truck overnight, and then got rid of a thousand chairs in a very short time indeed. And, um, and the, 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 the way it works is very much like uh, Google, by selling advertising on the chair. I think it's quite a good proposition for an advertiser to actually um, have a message in somebody's home for maybe two or three years, rather than um, have a, having a poster up for a week or a television advert for, um, for 25 seconds, right? So I think it's a model which, which I'd like to uh, roll out a bit. But I did start feeling a bit stupid immediately the day afterwards, when, again, on eBay, this stuff started turning up, and it starts off at 50 pounds, and then the chairs start selling at 200 pounds. So I could have been uh, 200,000 pounds richer if I'd been a bit more conventional. So that really didn't work. So then I, I tried another, another uh, type of uh, uh, idea about disruption, and I think you all know that the robots are coming um, to take away your jobs, right? And uh, actually it's the end of the road for many of you. But there's a small window of opportunity in between that nightmare scenario and now, where we can use robots to help us, particularly in design, you know. So I think everybody's very obsessed with um, rapid prototyping, and that's kind of nice, and a lot of people use it, but many, many things are made digitally right now without us even knowing it on these amazing machines, particularly in metalwork, where um, these, these uh, quite compact, uh, industrial machines are doing all of the components that go into cars and often into chairs without you really knowing it. Um, which made me think again about how I used to make things to suit a machine when I started off. And um, this is the machine. So we managed to take this machine with um, the kind help of a German partner called Trumpf that make these very um, high-tech uh, uh, laser punch presses which cut and punch and roll the metal. Um, with extreme speed, using very low-cost tooling. And they're very adaptable machines. And the idea here was really to, to, to design a chair to suit the machine um, and, and really to try and make the production in front of the audience. So by taking it to the Milan Furniture Fair and putting it in the Science Museum, um, this machine was able to make um, 200 chairs and 500 lamps. And actually, um, here I am with my... Uh, my chair, which is really made to suit the, uh, the tooling on the machine. And we were able to make one chair every six minutes, kind of thing. So, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Who's the man that appreciates the... <laughs> so again, how not to design is, is really to, um, to work with the engineers and try and work out what can be made on, on a specific machine. So we made a whole restaurant which we furnished in Milan and put in this incredible um, dining room, a 17th century dining room. And, um, and here I'm looking even smugger because now I've, I've, I've moved to New York and I'm now making lamps with the same machine at the New York Furniture Fair. So you have the advantage of a compact machine making things to measure in front of an audience and the people buying or, or, or you giving away the things free um, as you make them. So even closer to the, to the customer um, than, than, say, IKEA could do. So instead of moving the customer to the warehouse, which is IKEA's model, here I was, I was moving the factory to the consumer in a completely new way, I thought. So that's why I'm looking so smug, so happy. And then my lamps, I can adapt them, and, and you could become the designer. So again, me totally absolving my responsibility of design and saying, I'll just set up the parameters of what you can do, and you can make the pattern, and you can choose the size. So here's the same lamp, for instance, a two, two meter diameter rather than a 50 centimeter diameter, just because you can uh, manufacture these things in a parametric way.
So I think you know, in the future, what we'll see is the, is the high street becoming, um, rather than lots of abandoned shops or charity shops like we have it, or, or chicken, chicken restaurants like we have in London, we'll start seeing maybe manufacturing coming back into the city centre because it's digitalised, because you can make things to order, and because you can make things in a very high-tech way, in a clean way in the city centre. A bit like a, a medieval high street, maybe. That, that would be my hope. Um, and you know, we're experiment another reason why we're here in Stockholm is is because we're collaborating with Ega, a Danish carpet company, and and they're making um, themselves they're making uh, on demand digital printing carpet tiles. So these are the results of our experiments and and a new range that we've been doing um, in Denmark with. Um, this contract carpeting company. So we're on the verge of an amazing revolution in manufacturing and in, um, in technology, which I think none of us can really predict how it's going to go. But for a short while, I think the power comes to the designer as a mini industrialist, as uh, their own marketeer, in a way that was completely impossible when I started out. So if you ever get to Milan, we'll be in this space and we'll be doing some more experiments, I guess. So do come to the... Rotonda de la Bissana, which is a 17th century plague pit. So that's the Milan Furniture Fair in April. You're all invited. There's 200,000 bodies buried underneath this space, so it might, be, uh, it might have a weird energy, but it's a beautiful building. And then I'm just going to, my last project, the, the last thing that I want to tell you, I think that, you know, I think it, it could all go terribly wrong for me, for sure. Um, it's very risky being in this business. It's quite complicated logistically. It's complicated from a distribution and manufacturing point of view. But I've got an escape plan. And that escape plan is an underwater furniture farm, right? So I've been working on this project, which I'm going to tell you about, which is actually in the Bahamas. You can't really do it in Sweden because the water's too cold. So I have to do it in the Bahamas or Bali. And it, it, it's really about... Um, it's a uh, a technique I discovered from a 70s scientist that had dreamt of making underwater cities. So what you do is you get a metal framework and you sink it underwater um, and you link it up to a solar panel and the solar pan panel puts a, a small charge of electricity in the framework and what it does is to grow a skin of artificial coral or not artificial, it's actually a, a carbon capture technique because it's calcium carbonate. So just like um, chalk, you know, when you, when you have your kettle and, and the fur forms on the bottom, a deposit of calcium carbonate will form on the chairs and grow really quite rapidly um, in a warm sea with the right um, voltage of electricity going through. So this fish farm, or rather this furniture farm, and you can see here the, the growth rings, just like on a tree, um, where the water's cold, it's like chalk, and then when the water's hot, it's like rock on the outside, a bit like an M&M &M suite or something like that. But this is one year, one year of growth, one and a half years of growth on this chair. And so the chairs have been now underwater for three years, and they've become uh, uh, quite an attractive marine environment, also for um, sponges and other sea creatures. It also allows coral to regenerate. You can graft on broken pieces of coral, and they'll grow also at a rate of four or five times faster than they would in nature. So it becomes not only a, a, a means of me retiring on the beach with my chair, and this is a picture of me naked for all of you, fishing out my first chair from the Bahamas, um, and it could provide some income, perhaps, on the art market. I don't think they're very practical chairs, but I think I've proven that I can sell unpractical chairs before. Um, but it also provides a, a, an amazing um, possibility for um, uh, really creating a, a safe haven for marine life and, and uh, regenerating the, the ocean floor as well. So that's my retirement plan, and I'm going to leave you with that to think about that if it all goes wrong and you don't actually buy enough of my lights. So thank you for having me. Right. And... Questions. Yeah, OK, it's questions. Thank you. Hello. It works. Thank you so much, Tom, for that presentation. I would oh, like now like to. It's exhausting, <laughs> I imagine. But it's good Swedish water. Uh, I would now like to open up for questions. So, anyone, please feel free to ask questions to Tom. A question at the back there. <laughs> uh, 
What's my opinion of the Apple Watch? Well, they're giving them away, okay? <laughs> and um, I, it's, it uses up a lot of power, that's for sure. This one's actually not on. But, you know, I think it's a, an attractive piece of jewelry. <laughs> Any more questions? So the, the question is, where is traditional skill going, particularly in the upholstery trade, right? So I, th I think there's never been a better time. Well, okay, uh, there has been better times. But, you know, f from the perspective of all of the surrounding things um, in small businesses, your ability to appeal to an international market, to um, tell people about what you do without it costing you anything, your ability to take payment around the world, for instance, or to ship things around the world. I think everything surrounding you has become a much healthier environment for a small producer than it ever has before. But remember when I started, I had to actually get invitations printed, 200 pounds, stick a, 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 a stamp on each envelope, another 200 pounds, write out in longhand the address, you know, to have a party in my town. And that was the way you promoted yourself, right? Uh, or you had to wait three months for an article to come out um, about you where you didn't really know what the contents would be. All of that's changed, right? So people can know about what you do all over the globe immediately and you can have an international clientele base and you don't have to spend any money marketing yourself. So that's one advantage of the modern world. And people will come to you, you know, which they wouldn't have done before. And then on top of that, I think you can combine um, old and new techniques. You know, even in upholstery, you can make frames using CNC cutting of frames in a much faster and, and, and uh, easy way than it was ever possible before. And then you can still upholstery it in a traditional way. And I think it's a combination of, of, um, of, of craft and, and industry that I've always been interested in anyway. And I think the barriers to doing the industrial part have, have collapsed. Um, it's so much easier to access those techniques than ever was before. So it's going to be okay. Any more questions? There. Hi, um, I'm Hannah. We're, I'm a sustainable product design student in Cornwall, Falmouth University, um, and our course is all about sustainability. Um, so, just wondering what your opinion of the like last kind of 20 years in the furniture industry has um, how has sustainability affected that. Did you? I didn't hear it. <laughs> Do you want to repeat? So um, I'm a sustainable design student okay. in Cornwall. Cornwall. Um, yeah, <laughs> Falmouth University. Um, uh, what's my idea on sustainability? Yeah, essentially. Uh, okay. Um, I went to a car boot sale in Brighton the other day and I saw one of my pieces that was being bought in the car boot sale for only, uh, only two or three pounds. But it proved to me that, you know, that my sustainability angle, there's a lot of hypocrisy talked about it, actually, I think, in, in so many ways. A lot of the things that seem sustainable just aren't. But I think, so my view is really, if I can make things that last several generations and that people will still desire um, when they're finished with them, um, that's my, my uh, current view on what's totally possible. I mean, I've done many experiments in lots of different, um, you know, whether it's underwater, and that's not really sustainable because I have to jet off to the Bahamas, right, to do my underwater factory. Um, but I think that the future will bring also deconstructed manufacturing, which I think is a bit more sustainable. So you're not shipping things huge distances. Um, it will bring also smaller batches, you know, where you're not making huge amounts of stuff, which, you know, some of which is wasted. Um, I think it will um, bring new materials as well. So, you know, I think if it's harnessed in the right way, technology can um, help uh, the sustainability angle. Certainly there's lots of people working on much more um, uh, attractive recycling, for instance, at the moment. But, you know, we have to overcome it from a consumer perspective as well. I mean, people don't understand why recycled materials are 
more expensive than vir virgin materials, for instance. They always want those things to be cheap, you know. And so there's a customer, there's a job of kind of um, explanation for designers to do as well, of communication, you know. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a subject which you could take, you know, another week of conferences to even touch the, the very tip of the iceberg. So, yeah, for me, it's, it's really about longevity right now. Any more questions? Where do I start? Lady at the back. Hi, Tom. Um, I'm from the UK. I'm lighting <laughs> consultant. You have to all come from the UK to ask me <laughs> questions in Sweden. That's, I that's know, it's tragic. Great, isn't it? I could come to Kensington, <laughs> but I haven't. Um, I just want to know, I'm looking, I can get a lot of your stuff from John Lewis now, which is absolutely great. But I just want to know, for clients that are wanting a Tom Dixon special light that they can't necessarily find in their friends' houses, um, where would I start by getting something a bit more special for them? You, you want a special light from me? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what, what no, you mean? but you know, that's not available to are everybody. Are you trying to say that I'm too widely distributed? By well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's great for everybody, um, but if I'm wanting to yeah, do something a bit more you know, bespoke. For every, every light that's been a success, there's been at least you know, 20 disasters, which is sort of what I was talking about, is that you know, it's more interesting to talk about the things that went wrong than the things that went right. There's many, many lights that, um, that really uh, haven't made the the amount of turnover because they were too um, too complicated, too expensive, or because um, they didn't get shown properly, or because there were bad designs maybe as well. So there's loads of stuff. You can just come to one of our sample sales and you'll find lots of those actually. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the secondary market that I made in, you know, when I started I was making things in singles, right? Um, but they're becoming more expensive and, and rarer because they weren't very well made in the first place. They're sort of falling apart, right? So th there is some stuff around, and um, I'm sure we can direct you in the right, in the right uh, direction. But, yeah. Thank you. Sample sale, maybe. Any more? Can I go now? Tom, <laughs> you are free to go. Let's give a big round of applause for Tom Dixon. <laughs>